Last time we had a very interesting discussion on the business case for gender equality. This time we're going to be looking more at the soft side of things, of the things that are holding women back in the office. Uh, we're going to start off with Inga, who, who some of you may know from the Jump Forum. Uh, she's the author of a fabulous book called Be Gender Smart, The Key to Career Success for Women. And it's basically, I mean, she's going to share with you what the important, how it's important to be gender bilingual, how when you're in an organization uh, which has traditionally been, been built for men, actually <laughs> women uh, have their own specificities and these need to be taken into account. Should I hand over to you? Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming and for having me. And do you all speak English? Je parle un peu français, mais pas beaucoup. And it's very old Netherlands, but I can do it all in English for now. So that was my little Eurovision thing. You have our words. organizations. They 
enter into organisations, they put their head down and they work really hard, trying to be a good girl, doing their very best. And after a number of years, they start looking around and they realise that others have gone beyond them, have made promotion where they have not. And they realise it's the loud, pushy ones that are the ones that are getting the promotion. And that's when they start doing women's leadership programs. It's when they start looking for executive coaching, when they get mentors and sponsors, and they learn. They learn about gravitas, they learn a about boosting their profile, they learn about networking, <coughs> they learn you need to boast about your achievements and be visible and have a profile. And it works for some, because we do have a lot of women in senior positions, women are breaking through the glass ceiling in some places, but it doesn't work for many because women are leaving. And I'll show you some numbers. Barbara Ennis, in 2013, did interviews with 2,000 women from the United States, Asia, but also Europe. Senior women, and ask them why they left. And when she goes deeper into the, and she does deep depth interviews, because these women, you know, they give like reasons like, oh yeah, I just want to be more with my children. But for Ennis, the bottom reason, 30% then actually told her in those interviews that one of the reasons they left was indeed work life issues. But 50% of these women, when you ask a bit deeper, say, well, I also didn't see any opportunities for advancement because I'm no longer interesting. I'm looking ahead and I see a male-dominated environment that I don't want to be part of. I don't want to be part of that loud, pushy, shouty bunch there somehow. And they feel excluded and undervalued. Now, this is a cultural thing more than anything else. And to me, this shows that organizations are designed for man. And women feel like a fish out of the water in those organizations. And we try equal opportunities for women, and I think this is what happens. Can you read it? <laughs> so for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. I think this is what equal opportunities do. Men and women are different. So what do we need to do instead? What we need to do instead is find out what it is that women need. Find out what kind of different skills women bring and leverage those skills. We need to create organizations for women, organizations that work for both men and women, organizations where women are valued for what they bring. What we need to do is create rivers. So those fish no longer have to grow arms. We need to create ponds where those and rivers and oceans may be, where those women can swim freely, where they feel they are valued for what they bring and encouraged to swim even more. Because you know that little girl, that five-year-old girl? I'm quacking, but what we're trying to do here is actually that we're trying to sort of teach that little girl all kinds of skills to, to push through. But instead, just imagine, if we would teach that teacher that that little girl wants to go karts just as badly as the boys up front, then it would be easy for that teacher to come up with a system that gives the boys and the girls opportunities to get go karts, surely. Now that's where I usually stop and open up for questions to talk about the concept. So I wanted to do that here, but I know what the first two questions are going to be, so I thought I'd answer them. Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> because when you talk about women being different, obviously this is all gender stereotyping ones. Again, that's what people tell me. This is not going to be good for women. So I'll show you, um, does it really work? That's the second question. So I've wrapped those together. I'm hoping to show you what I, what I did, what I do with organisations. I've defined six key gender differences that I talk about in my, uh, in my book. And I found them in literature, neuroscience, um, literature on psychology, and I looked for the sort of proper founded science, things that we can actually say there are some differences, because some of this is still very debated, obviously. And there are sort of, I defined group that very unscientifically into six key areas, so it becomes easy to teach and to, um, to talk about rather than still being scientific. So I took it a bit more practical, and I teach these differences to men and women in companies. And when I teach them to women, what happens? They come up to me afterwards, and I was in Royal Bank of Scotland recently, and a lady said to me, look, for 15 years I've been here in sales, <coughs> for 15 years I get told that I'm too emotional. 
And she says, I was always thinking, oh yeah, I'm, I'm made, I need to be less emotional, I'm doing something wrong here. But recently, someone, but she's realized herself that actually that's why she has such good relationships with her clients. That's why she bonds so well with her clients. So someone came up to her, her recently, and you know what she said to them? They said, oh, you're just too emotional. And she said, yes. And that's why I have such good, strong bonds with my clients. That's why they keep coming back to me. And I think that's what we want women to do. We want them to be able to follow their own way of achieving targets and be proud of how they work and bring value the way you want to. And I think when you teach them this is how you're different and this is how it can bring value, it helps women say those things. And I do workshops with mixed gender teams and leaders as well. And I tell leaders that men and women compete differently. Now, you just, I'm not going to have little time to explain, so you need to just take this from me today. Men compete on being the biggest, the best, the strongest, and the fastest. Okay, look at me. Women compete too, but women tend to compete on being nice, being liked, being popular, having relationships. Now, if you compete on being liked and being nice, it's really hard to put yourself forward and say, hey, I think I did really well in the past three projects. I believe I'm in my do a, a good stretch project and the pay that comes with that. People might not like you if you do that. So for women, there's a big psychological barrier to putting themselves forward. It's not just a skill they have not practice from the age of three, it's also a psychological barrier. <coughs> Whereas boys, it, with, in groups of boys, this behavior is much more acceptable. So what you, when I tell this to managers, they instantly get it. They're like, oh, okay. Someone, uh, the head of a lab came up to me recently and he said, now I get it. I thought the women in my team never came to see me because they're just not interested in promotion. But what you're saying is they're interested, but they're just not telling me. So I need to just go and ask them. See, that's what we want managers to do. We want managers to understand where to raise awareness of the issues that women tend to have, and we want managers to do something with that, to flex their style and make sure they encourage women where they might be challenging men. And then I do this with uh, organized for employees, yeah, where employees actually watch uh, the stuff that happens is women say, women say to me, oh, so I get it, men just need to sort of take up a bit of space in a meeting because it's a bit of a status thing. I won't take it personal anymore. So there's a bit of understanding going on there between the people in the team of why someone's doing something. And then in organizations, obviously there's the types of, when you start looking at difference, you find things like they found in MBAs. In MBAs, they were recruiting, um, wanted to recruit more women. So what they did, um, they tested all kinds of texts. And what they found that the text that tended to work for men was the text that's based on standards. It is, you can earn this much more in this MBA, this famous CEO has actually been to his MBA, and we have this famous teacher who's working here. Data and facts based on status, because men tend to take decisions based on data and facts. Women take decisions differently. They tend to take decisions on people and process. And they found the language that tends to work for women was things like the culture at campus, what it like to work in teams, to do case studies, to invite women to open days where they can meet some of the teachers, and that seemed to be much more powerful. What also works for women is to talk about uh, impact and future impact. So um, we are, uh, we're doing this research, and rather than saying how brilliant and, and mind-blowing this research is, and, and last, um, of the last new century research, you talk about how it's going to impact society, how it's bringing benefits to people, how it's giving more in, uh, this, wo this woman who's going to get this job more influence um, in the world. And that's the type of language that tends to work for women. So as soon as organizations start looking at their recruitment and promotional uh, practices, they get this too. <coughs> no. Yeah, so I wanted to, I do have some practical tips as well, but I thought I'll take questions first. <coughs> and see, do you want to go practical or do you want to go conceptual? And then, so, questions. <laughs> Yeah. One question. So I'm working for a Cisco um, technical company, and I'm an engineer myself as well. So what um, what you are saying, like 
woman tend to behave like that. And in a, what I'm on, uh, observing <coughs> in an organization with totally technical, with lots of engineers, it's uh, and when you have women managers, it's a different. Even they are women, I think they also this start. Uh, uh, how to say? Imitating the or uh, be like a man, uh, or I would say, uh, not like a man, or, or try to be not different with, from the di uh, other managers, and they also have to do the same. So their selection process and decision process, I don't know, it, sometimes it's difficult for me to figure out is, it, sh is she really like that, or she's trying to be somebody else and try to play the same game as the others. So what do you mean? Yeah, obviously, I mean, I'm putting it very black and white here. That's also not the reality. You know? So none of the science actually says that, you know, you look at a woman's brain and it instantly know it's a woman's brain. You can't even, it's, there's not that big a difference. So there is, I think, what was 98% your brains are the same. So, yeah, we, we're sort of human beings are made to take yeah, to take on each other's tasks, you know, dads can look out for a family just as well as moms can, and the other way, women can bring in the money and build a house just as well as dads can, but they, what does, we do have different preferences, but a preference at birth or stuff, yeah, doesn't actually mean that that's what you're going to do, so let's say if you grow up with boys, your, your brain changes all the time, you learn behavior that works for you, and that's behavior you feel comfortable with. So when you grow up with boys or when you actually work with men, obviously you learn what works and you come into a business and you learn what works. Yeah. And then I think for some women that feels that, that is just natural regardless. You know, so yeah, these women can <coughs> select. But I think if you then look at the bigger picture, it's super, super helpful to make that black and white split and say organizations were built for men. Now we need to add what works for women and we have we got organizations that work for everyone. For the man that didn't fit in in the first place, you know, and yeah, sort of for the man that feel man get wider, really interesting man get also wider behavior strategies from this. Like they see how women work and they're like, really, is that accepted? Oh, I'll try that. And they, yeah, and it works for some of them too. So it's sort of it's not that black and white. Did you have an experience that? Um Depending on which generation we're talking about, we are moving to a more woman type of culture. So, uh, where I completely agree with your uh, yeah. definition uh, at our management level today in most of the companies, uh, I do believe or I do hope that the millennials and the Gen Y have a delta or difference which are a lot uh, smaller. Than, than our management. So have any experience, any data that you could share up? Well, it's very different per country, I would say. So um, it, yeah, it's, it's really hard to tell whether it is that, that you would think they move more together maybe and have more of each other's uh, behaviors. But somehow I'm not seeing that in the younger generations that grow up with there seems to be even bigger differences with the girls, you know, in the skimpy dresses and that grow up with very sexual images of women. They seem to have very rigid ideas on, on what gender is, or not rigid ideas on what gender is, but because they, they also do transgender at age 16, this is the latest fashion, that you don't know yet what gender you are. But I'm not sure if that comes with, with a wider, a large set of behaviors. So I, 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 it's an interesting question whether it changes it's just when I look at the new generation that we are hiring, right? yeah, we'll in yeah. we are hiring at the bottom, right? Yeah. We are not uh, yeah. hiring at all level. And you clearly see that they are more collaborative, men and women. Yeah. That they, yes, they want to compete, but they compete in a different way. They're creating those sub teams, um, right. coming with ideas and partnering. How interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I was wondering if it's just because, I mean, the difference between the newest yeah. and the oldest are uh, so visible to our eyes in yeah, other maybe. companies. Uh. Because what I do see is that now that we have more women at the top, I think initially you had to be very loyal. You know, think Margaret Thatcher. Um, you all know Margaret Thatcher, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think that because women still have to prove even that 
yeah, that it could be done, you know. So whereas now I see much more women at senior levels, you know, yeah, like Cheryl Sandberg, I think, allowing herself to say, I'm a woman and I'm proud to be a woman. And, but also, I don't know, there's a wider variety of how we need to dress as a woman at the top, which, yeah, it's just an external thing, the external thing. But I think it is, yeah, there is probably more, more space to be different types of women as well. I think they act more as role models, you know, more these women at, at the top, and yeah. it's up to them creating more awareness. So I'll give you, I thought it was funny when you talked about the emotions. I worked in the corporate world for 25 years, and I started when I was 24, and every year my appraisal was the same thing. You're far too emotional, far too emotional. <laughs> and at, at a certain point, but it didn't take me too long, I said, you know, but this is my strength, and you know, emotion, what is emotion? You scream when you're upset, or you're not, you, you disagree, that's an emotion. I might cry if I'm upset, or I do something like that. So the point that I'm trying to make is that you really need to create awareness. Around. And talking to other women, other women, I was a leader, Craig came to me and said, I'm going to cry. I said, cry, fine, no problem. That's an emotion. The other one will probably be upset with me and scream at me, and, or a man will, do, will act differently in his emotions. It's just Again, creating awareness, awareness and allowing the emotions in my So what kind of things did you do that were emotional then? Like actually crying or was it or was it a much wider range of like when But it's just more the, the passion and you know or you know yeah. being passionate and you know saying this is just so unright or not correct and but that's an emotional and then I could really get very passionate about yeah. whether you know, you could say yeah. it in a different way. I, I'll, I'll remember, I told the told novella last week, I read an article in the Harvard Business Review, I admit it was 15 years ago, but still, it was an article uh, of an observation of a professor, uh, a woman leading a, a meeting. The man, but she was the only woman, the man started discussing with her, and she, she didn't know what to do, so she started crying. So the, the professor wrote, you know, why does she start crying, you know, why doesn't she, and he was serious in this article, why don't, why don't you start, you know, discussing and screaming and, and whatever, being upset like men do, and for him that was the norm, that was the value. This, and this is man and women, women. it's very interesting, because I mean, I recently read a piece on the uh, on internet somewhere in one of these chat forums, and it was a very senior woman, she said, look, women just don't want senior jobs. I was offering a stretch project to one of the younger women, I was putting my neck on, out for her, and she's saying, oh, I'm not sure I can do it. You've got to be keen to get these. If she doesn't have the ambition now, then you know, if she's not keen now, then she was really angry that young women just weren't taking the opportunities. So. And I thought, well, that's just how women show their keenness. They're very realistic, you know? And actually, when I once said to my brilliant boss at some point, I'm not sure I can do it, he said, okay, so which parts of this project can you not do? Because you wanted to be a trainer and I'm giving you a training job, which parts, and I thought, yeah, I can go to the training program, I can then make it into, you know, each part I could do, and I said, okay, I'll take on. You know, but it, it's not that I didn't want it, but it's sort of I needed just a little bit of support, some encouragement to sort of get over that barrier, and it, yeah, it, that is, yeah, it's just a different way of doing it. I really recognize what you just said about emotion, and, and I personally think I've heard it a lot all my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's also about your company culture and how yeah. emotion as such is perceived as it, when it equals weakness, which in some cases it does, yeah. uh, th then obviously you're going to have defensive reactions. Uh, I often, in, instead of saying, you know, do you see it as weakness? I, I, I rephrase it and say, how, how willing are you to have an uncomfortable <laughs> conversation? And, and, and then, you know, but that it's, it's, I really recognize this. Yeah. That, that, you know, being yeah. emotional is, is, is per se being perceived as, you know. But that's what Inga just said, because companies are created by men where emotions are never allowed, or yes. they yeah. were not just weak, yeah. it, was, it was seen as, as weak to the point, yes. which it yes. isn't. And I think it starts very early in boys' education. Yeah. When you know they, they are told to be to man up and not to cry. Yeah. And, and, and so it's also peer pressure. So you need to change education. It's something that also you should allow boys to be boys. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Because boys are taught from a very young age that you're not allowed to boast. That's not right. And all the male female teachers tell them that. You know what my little boy does? He finds different ways to boast. 
Look, I don't want to boast, but you know, I did make the most goals in this match. <laughs> Brilliant, right? I mean, don't find, you don't find ways where it can go, it's all right. Shall I go to some practical uh, things now? I wanted to add something. You want to add something? Yeah, because ahead, um, the, the discussion is very much interesting, and I, I pretty much agree with the law that things do change. But I'm afraid they are changing for men. Uh, men are more and more valued if they show their femininity. Mm -hmm. And it's nowadays even accepted, even valued in the workplace. It, not in every workplace, mm -hmm. but in some workplace it, it does. And if we, if we look, for example, at Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, um, <laughs> we see fun. that when Barack is crying, um, crying, he has some tears in his eyes, mm -hmm. so he, he, he shows emotion, then everybody says, wow, what a great man, what a fantastic uh, president, and so, so he, 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 because he can ally masculinity, very strong masculinity, and even femininity, so it's really valued. But I don't know if you remembered, uh, if you remember last campaign that Hillary uh, did, not this one, last one, uh, she, one, only one time, at a certain point she was in the, in the network with only women, and, and one woman dared to ask her, but isn't it too, too, too difficult to bear that campaign, very long campaign, so, so hard, so difficult, so tough, and so on. And, and, and then her eyes be, began only to be a, a, a slightly wet, not, nothing else. She had to take a breath. Yes, it's not easy. It's not. This is not the the, the, the biggest, uh, but the easiest uh, part of my life. But I'm enjoying it. Blah 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 blah. And then all the newspapers um, said uh, she's not good for the job because she's not strong enough. Uh, she shows it uh, emotions. She's really fragile and weak. And she made at that point. And I I, I was in the in the US and I and I bought something from her campaign. And it was you know the, the, the perfume that you put in your in your in your car, yeah. and it was her picture with "I'm your man." And uh, for her, this was fundamental because she needed to show the world that she's good for the job. And the, and why I'm I'm saying that is that when a when a man nowadays have uh, female values, female attitudes, what so-called female values and female attitudes, this is this is good for him. Yeah. But when a woman does, this is not valued at all. She's then she she's she she's not vulnerable. She's weak. This is the very big difference. And this is why yes, it changes, but it changes mainly for men. And we have to. Okay, I think so. And yeah. then the, 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 oh, the, the other point to find just the other watch out, I would say, is that you you can say and drive a culture where you're going to be open about your emotions. But a lot of men don't know how to manage them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yes. Which means that automatically, I mean, and we had that discussion with some of our um, leaders. We were talking about the mentoring relationship we have with men and women. And we were asking them, you know, what type of advice do you give to the men? And they, they explained, some of them said, I will be more candid with the men because I know how he's going to react. Yeah. With a woman, I'm so afraid that she may start to cry and I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> but I'm not telling, I'm talking about something else. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, so it's important to tell a woman, be more open, don't, don't be shy, share your emotion. But behind, you really need to put in place a certain program that can really drive awareness and also explain to the leaders how to manage with that because they're not used to that. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe something to add, just yeah. in a discussion, and we also will come to emotions um, so there, when, we, when we talk about it. But I think what's also important, and this is a study, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you know, we fact some figures, it's a study of Goldman, yeah, the, the writer of Emotional Intelligence, who clearly shows that emotional intelligence, how important it is in leadership. And he did a study of star performance, um, and he showed that in jobs of all kinds, um, it's precisely the emotional intelligence skills that uh, value for, I think, 65%, yes. and leadership jobs is even 85%. Yes. 
So I think we need to put that into the discussion because emotions, what do we mean by emotion? Mm -hmm. Is it the observation? Is it how we translate it? I'm sure men also have emotions and they have clearly the emotional intelligence because there are so many male leaders. So, so I think it's interesting to, to reflect on this as well. Yeah, in my book I talk about empathy and what's very interesting is that men are seen to have less empathy, but it's very interesting because men have empathy for other things. So men tend to be, and I need to be careful because not man and women, that black and white, but men tend to be uh, more aware, more politically astute, more aware of power relationships. On, so they men tend to enter a room and they sort of know who's got their backs, who's their ally, and who's, who's their enemy. And they're quite aware of that, which is a very powerful, they're putting themselves in someone else's shoes, but they then look at the power aspects of that, which is very important in the company, and we don't want to it's another type of emotional intelligence, you know, being aware of what anger means and how to use anger, and, which is also an emotion. Which I think just to comment on what was said about uh, emotion uh, not being used because it's a weakness. In fact, it's because of the fear of the power of emotions. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason <laughs> why, yeah, the, the reason why we repress those emotions between males is because we don't know how to handle them. Yeah. And it's much easier to be on command and control, uh, very uh, uh, Cartesian, if I can say so, very cognitive, and leave all the other dimensions aside because it's on safe ground, or it feels like being on safe ground. And as you start actually to enter within these uh, emotions, you get into resonance. It's completely different. You really uplift yeah. the people, or you put them down. Mm. So mm. this is much more delicate. And I think this is the reason why really those emotions have been left outside of the company so far. Mm. This is changing definitely. Okay. Do I have time to for some practical tips or I mean don't know anyone? Because needs to be signing Quite good like yeah. five minutes. Oh okay. I think <laughs> <not. laughs> that's <laughs> So, in our discussion, and it's exactly what's been coming out, we need to teach women what those differences are and how they bring value, and then speak up about it. So, we're saying, hey, I'm emotional, but this is how it brings corporate value. But also, you need to teach women, and we touched on that when we used to cry, men are afraid of it, to frame it, to say, hey, I use a facilitative leadership style, but just give me half a year, and I'll prove that that actually improves team performance and it may look a bit chaotic, but actually I create a lot of buy-in and afterwards we get a lot of um, extra productivity. Give me half a year to prove that. So you sort of frame, like you, you perfectly say, look, maybe I cry in a meeting, but actually for me that isn't very deep. It's just an emotion like you would shout. Can you please give me that feedback? So it's about sort of also explaining yourself a bit more. We're going to need to do a bit more explaining because we have cultures that were business cultures that were built for men. It's the same, you know, if dads come to school, you know, if, you know another, if there, there's a female culture in the playground, so or, or the school, uh, the school gates, and when men come there, they, they sort of, yeah, need to adapt, and that should also change with it. So it's, businesses are made for men, and you need to then explain a bit more of how you work and how it brings value, and do it so they can do it. And yeah, how you can do that in your company. Some of, actually I know um, a company which just takes one chapter, one for each of the six, um, six uh, differences, and has discussion groups about them, and has people learn from them. So it's something you can actually do just by buying a book. You don't have to buy my workshops to do this. Then where I like to focus there is on the leadership, you know, the managers. They are often key to help, yeah, to, to help women uh, progress and they are also key if women aren't advancing. I think just teaching them to be open to difference, even if they don't know what the differences are, maybe assume it might be different for men. Ask a question, how do I need to give feedback so it works for you? How do I encourage you best? Maybe she doesn't want candid feedback, well that's fine. You know, what kind of feedback helps her to perform? Because I do, um, I did a lot of interviews with top sports coaches, and they, yeah, they really said that when they started working with female teams, they said, look, I have, you're coaching an individual, so men and women are not different in that sense. You know, I'm coaching individuals, and each man is different. Now I'm working with a women's team, yeah, so each woman is different. 
but they did have to learn then. So, but that said, I had to learn some new techniques when I started working with women. And one of them was that they had to be much more encouraging, much more supportive, much more, for instance, give much more regular feedback. You know, when you say to a man, you were brilliant in a match today, and then you don't say anything to him for six weeks, he just thinks for six weeks he's brilliant. And this is what sports coaches tell me, right? This is not. <laughs> Apparently, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. Do the same with a woman. Two weeks later, she comes back and says, You haven't said anything for two weeks? Am I, uh, am I doing something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> am I no longer performing here? <laughs> so she starts losing confidence. And she needs much more regular feedback. And there are all kinds of psychological reasons for that that I write about in the book. But, and I explain those to leaders, and they get it. You know, they then take it on and and yeah, use a more encouraging style for women, or try it out. It doesn't work for all women, you know, some women love the challenges. I bet you can't do that, it might work for you, you know? No, I'm gonna prove myself. Some women flourish under that. So you need to sort of obviously be individual. And managers, I also teach them, you should do support a female style of working. The chairman in the NHS did that really beautifully. He invited a woman in his board. And the NHS, sorry, that is like a, a major hospital. So he had a, a woman in, uh, in his board, and she would ask more questions because women tend to have more connections in their brain. They like to see the bigger picture before they go to solutions. They like to sort of see consequence and impact. So she asked more questions. Women tend to ask them more why. So those meetings took longer. <laughs> so he said, isn't it brilliant we've got Caroline here now? Because she's making sure our decisions are really founded. And he would actually stop at some point and look at her and say, I'm sure that uh, Isabel's got some more questions here that we really need to consider. Giving her that space to bring in what she was, why he actually invited her on that board in the first place, to have more discussion, to have more diversity. Now I'm explaining that it's okay if you have more emotions because it's bringing value. You can imagine that, that's just so much more powerful. And then here are some really practical tips, starting at the bottom. Obviously, men and women have different career paths between the age of 30 and 40. Women tend to focus on their family. At the age of 50, testosterone levels in women rise. They get more ambition. Get a lot of female professors above that age. Very interesting. But we, in our companies, if you look at promotion, it's between the age of 30 and 40 that you have to prove yourself. You know, if you start, there's sort of no, if you start proving yourself after 50, there's no career paths for that. There's no career paths for women that tend to sort of do a bit more wider variety of jobs or come from a different place in an organization. Maybe they haven't gone through operations, but they've entered in HR. So how can they move on? So look at a wider variety of career paths for women. Obviously, flexible working, men more and more start to like this too, so they need to go there anyway, so it's not necessarily the gender difference anymore. But also, so look at your processes, your promotion and recruitment processes. Is there any sort of gender bias in there? Are you speaking gender by are you doing gender bilingual communication like um, like the MBAs do? Are you talking about that uh, impact on the world? Are you talking about people and cultural aspects of your organization and your recruitment procedures? When you one of the things you can do, for instance, and invite role models to women's networks. But it can be male and female role models. But just to show that people in more senior jobs are human too. So if there's a male person, ask them to talk about what it was like for them to step up, what it was like for them when they had children and how they managed at home. But you, when there is a human person there and they're, they're saying why they're enjoying doing their job and why they stepped up, that is just as powerful. Just to have that human connection. That's being gender bilingual, it's adding the female language to the male language to the male language. And there's a brilliant um, app out there, it's Cat Matsfield, and she can actually, your, um, your advertisements, you just drop it in there and she says which male words are in there. And then you can look at this, like she has a list of typically female words and typically male words. Who is she? Cat Matsfield. Yeah, just go to, it's really easy. You just drop in your recruitment advert and it says if you, there's a word like challenge, you can see highlight that and, you know, word like partnership. How do you spell it? K A T. And then M A T. I think it's S and then field, but it could also be Matthew. It's, it's called the gender decoder. Gender decoder. <laughs> <laughs> it's just great fun. <laughs> but it is based on science. It's just 
just want to be outward things. You can do, obviously it's about mindset that there can be difference with them. And yeah, your appraisal systems and promotional practices, are they gender buying or to how are you doing things that work for are they about encouraging and asking people? Or are are you are you stretch projects and the MBAs that you offer in your organization, are they actually for people that put themselves forward or that their manager is putting forward? Or are you drawing people in? Are you asking people? Are you encouraging people? So I think if you do all these four areas, that's when you're going to be successful. If you focus just on the women, they'll still be in the same environment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a great discussion. Thanks a lot, Inga. Um, I think what's really interesting is that uh, if you look at it from a feminist standpoint, for many, many years, women have been fighting to try and be equal to men. And recently, we've started hearing more and more discussions saying, well, actually, women should be treated equally, but they're not necessarily equal in, in the specific sense. And we're allowing discussions to say there are differences. Uh, and Inga just showed that uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, there's also a very interesting article by Viva Wittenberg Cox, which is called uh, Holding to uh, Holding Women, no, treating, treating Women Like Men is Holding Them Back. Uh, so, so I'll put that in the readings after this session, and I definitely recommend having a look at it because it's a, it also brings a very interesting approach similar to this one.